Chapter 17, The Occlusion. Learning Objectives. Occlusion is the relationship of the teeth in the mandibular arch as they occlude with the maxillary arch. That occluding means coming together. The occlusion is examined and recorded as part of the oral assessment. Recognizing a patient's occlusion and understanding the oral health problems of malocclusion can aid in the following. One, providing information for the comprehensive assessment and planning dental hygiene care. Two, planning personalized instruction in relationship to factors such as oral habits, uh, chewing efficiency, uh, personal oral health care procedures, and predisposing factors to dental and periodontal infections. Three, adapting techniques of instrumentation to malpositioned teeth or groups of teeth. And four, uh, planning the frequency of maintenance appointments for professional care on the basis of deposit retention, particularly to the teeth that are difficult to reach uh, in our routine oral health care. So providing recognition of malocclusion and identifying uh, patients needing an orthodontic referral is also necessary. Okay, so let's talk about static occlusion relationships. They are seen when the jaws are closed in centric occlusion. The static occlusion can be observed in occluded casts, study casts, so that's like when you go to the orthodontist and they take impressions and then they pour them up and you see an exact replica of your teeth. That is a study cast. <clears throat> they can also be seen directly in the oral cavity when the lips and cheeks are retracted. So classification of malocclusion and the variations that occur with each category are going to be described here. We have our normal occlusion, our malocclusion, uh, types of facial profiles, malrelationships of groups of teeth, and malpositions of individual teeth. So let's start with uh, normal or ideal occlusion. The ideal mechanical relationship between the teeth of the maxillary arch and the teeth of the mandibular arch are as follows. All of the teeth in the maxillary arch are in maximum contact with the teeth of the mandibular arch in a definite pattern, okay? So everything is hitting together at the same time. Everything is contacting where it's supposed to be. This is our normal or ideal occlusion. What you also need to know about the normal and ideal occlusion is that the maxillary teeth slightly overlap the teeth on the facial surfaces, the mandibular teeth on the facial surfaces. So Everybody should have just a slight overbite and slight overjet, okay? We have a normal range of that. The posterior teeth, the buccal cusps, should be going over the buccal cusp uh, of the mandibular teeth, okay? So the buccal cusp of the mandibular teeth are going to go into those that central groove area of the maxillary teeth. Malocclusion is any deviation from the physiologically accepted relationship of the maxillary arch and or teeth to the mandibular arch and or teeth. Now, we have three types of facial profiles, right? And we've talked about those. We have our mesognathic, and that is just having a slightly protruded jaws. It kind of gives the facial outline uh, of a relatively flat appearance, okay? That's kind of what we want, right? Then we have retrognathic, and that's where the maxilla is a little more prominent, and the mandible uh, is posterior to its normal relationship. So it gives it kind of a convex profile. Then we have our prognathic, pro meaning protruding, all right? The man, we're usually talking about the mandible, right? Because that's the one that can move. 
So we have a protruded mandible. Okay, so it gives it kind of a concave profile. A male relationship of groups of teeth, we want to consider cross bites. So uh, posterior, the as I stated earlier, the maxillary teeth should go the buccal cusp of the max of the maxillary posterior teeth should go over the buccal cusp of the mandibular teeth. Okay? And this should happen bilaterally. If it doesn't, if one side isn't in that relationship, then we would call it a unilateral crossbite. If it happens on both sides, say that maxillary jaw is really narrow, but the mandible isn't, then we would have it as bilateral crossbites. Now, in the anterior, the maxillary incisors um, would be lingual to the mandibular incisors, and I showed a picture of that last week. So that is considered a crossbite. Now that anterior crossbite can be found with that prognathic uh, profile, okay, with that mandibular jaw protruding forward. Uh, posterior crossbite, again, the mandibular teeth are uh, lingual to normal position, and then the uh, mandibular teeth are facial to normal position. Okay. Then we can have an edge to edge bite. And this is where the incisal surfaces of the maxillary anterior teeth occlude with the incisal surfaces of the mandibular teeth instead of overlapping in a normal uh, bite. Okay. So that is edge to edge. Edge to edge happens in the anterior because you have an incisal edge. Then we have end to end, and that's when our posterior teeth occlude on the cusp to cusp type of relationship. Okay? So edge to edge is in the anterior. That's where the incisal edges occlude. And then we have end to end, which is where the cusps occlude on the maxillary and mandibular, okay? So it's kind of the same thing, it's just where it's happening in the mouth. Then we have uh, an open bite, and that's a lack of inclusal or incisal contact between the maxillary and the mandibular teeth. So this can happen with one tooth or a group of teeth, right? And because neither or both have failed to reach that final line of occlusion, so teeth cannot be brought together and a space remains as a result of the arch, of the arching of the line of occlusion. Okay, so you can see through there, these teeth don't occlude. Now an overjet is the horizontal difference in distance between the labial incisal surface of the mandibular incisors and the lingual incisal surfaces of the maxillary incisors. So let me say that again so you can just kind of close your eyes and visualize it. It's the horizontal distance between the labial incisal or we'll say facial incisal surfaces of the mandibular incisors and the lingual incisal surfaces of the maxillary incisors. Okay, so hopefully you're able to envision that. Uh, one way to measure the amount of overjet is to place the tip of the probe on the labial surface of the mandibular incisors and holding it horizontally against the incisal edge of the maxillary tooth. Then you read the distance in millimeters, okay? So you're placing the tip of the probe on the uh, mandibular tooth and then measuring it 
until it touches the lingual surface of the maxillary tooth. <clears throat> then we have under jet, and that is where the maxillary teeth are lingual to the mandibular teeth. Okay, so this is a crossbite, right? And then you measure the distances there. So, uh, as far as the mirror view, you can, by placing the mouth mirror under the incisal edge of the maxillary teeth, one can sometimes see the mandibular teeth in contact with the maxillary palatal gingiva. And that's if there's a severe uh, overjet. So it's so severe that you're going to see uh, the incisal edge of those mandibular teeth not occluding with tooth structure, but actually occluding with the gingiva on the maxilla. Okay. Um, malposition of individual teeth, you can have labioversion. That's when a tooth has uh, taken on a position that is more labial or facial or buccal, right? to all the other teeth, to its normal uh, positioning. Then we have lingual version, and of course that means that the tooth has positioned itself lingual to the normal position. Then we have buccal version, where it is more buccal. Okay, so this would be in the posterior. And then we have supraversion, which is an elongated, um, so it's above the line of occlusion. Then we have a torsiversion, which means that the tooth has rotated. So torso means kind of twist, it's rotated. And then we have infra, infraversion, and that is uh, depressed below the line of occlusion. So this would be, an example would be a primary tooth that's submerged or ankylosed, and we talked about ankylosed briefly um, the other day. Okay, so here we have our three uh, facial profiles. We have our mesognathic here in the middle. Grab my pen. Okay, here's our mesognathic. Meso, okay. And notice how it's just kind of straight or flat. All right. Then we have our retro. Retro meaning going backwards. And we're always looking at the relationship of the mandible. And then our prognathic, you notice the mandible has protruded. So those are our three different facial profiles. Okay, we have our cross bites, our edge-to-edge -edge bites, end-to-end -end bite, open bite, over jet, and under jet. And those are all of our male relations. Cross bite is when the maxillary teeth have switched the occlusion instead of being slightly buccal or labial to the mandibular teeth. Now they're going to be slightly uh, lingual to the maxillary or to the mandibular teeth. Then we have our edge to edge bite. Remember that only happens in the anterior. It's where the edge, the incisal edge of the maxillary teeth are meeting with the incisal edge of the mandibular teeth. That is not a normal relationship. We want our maxillary teeth to be slightly labial to the mandibular teeth. Then we have our end-to-end -end bite, and that's where the cusps of the maxillary teeth meet the cusp tips 
of the mandibular posterior teeth. So edge to edge anterior, end to end posterior. Then we have an open bite and that's where the teeth have not erupted into occlusion. Something has, has stopped them from contacting the other teeth. We have over jet, which is the horizontal movement of the anterior teeth, and that usually happens from them flaring out a little bit, okay? And that's measured with a probe, placing the tip of the probe horizontally. The tip of the probe is going to touch the mandibular tooth, and you're going to measure until it contacts the maxillary tooth. Then we have under jet, and that happens in an anterior crossbite where the maxillary teeth have now moved lingually, lingual to the mandibular teeth, and then you measure that. Okay? And here is some examples of uh, crossbites. Okay? We have an A, the mandibular teeth are completely lingual to their normal position. Okay? So the mandibular teeth, that mandible is too narrow. Then in B, we have mandibular teeth that are facial to their normal position. And then we have C, which is a unilateral uh, crossbite. Okay? The right side is normal, and the left side, the mandibular teeth, are facial to their normal position. Okay? So if you're looking at this, unilateral, this is correct positioning. This is incorrect positioning. So this is unilateral. There we go. Unilateral. And then when we're talking about the mandible in B, you can see the mandibular teeth have moved buckly. Okay? So this cusp here on the maxillary, this cusp should be right here on the buccal portion of the mandibular molar. And then this is also another form of crossbite, and that is where the mandibular teeth have moved so far lingually, this is on A, uh, they've moved so far lingually that they really aren't even in contact other than on the lingual surface of the maxillary teeth. And this is from a narrow whoops, narrow mandible, and this is from a narrow maxilla B is. Okay, so why is that significant? Well, that's going to determine what the orthodontist is going to do. Okay, do they need to spread this arch on B? They're going to spread the maxillary arch. And then on uh, A, it's a little more tricky. They're going to try and spread that mandibular arch if we catch this early on. Okay, so here we have a crossbite and it is in the anterior, right? Because we see the maxillary incisors are lingual to the mandibular incisors. So this is our maxillary and this is our mandibular. Okay. 
Here we have an edge to edge occlusion and you can see the incisal surface of the maxillary tooth is in contact with the incisal edge of the mandibular tooth. So you can imagine, you know, this is an issue because it if there's any grinding, they're just going to wear each other down, right? So, and then eventually we'll get that exposed dentin. Here's our edge to edge, or excuse me, our end to end bite. And this is where the molars or premolars, so our posterior teeth, occlude on the cusp tips. So you're going to see wear on all of these tips, okay? This is our maxillary again, and this is our mandibular. There we go. Here's our open bite, and this is a lack of occlusion or incisal contact between certain maxillary and mandibular teeth because either or both have failed to reach the line of occlusion. The teeth cannot be brought together and a space remains as a result of the arching of the line of occlusion. Okay, so we can see this whole uh, open space here, this open bite. Sorry, I'm using a mouse on a small table. Okay, so all of this is open. No matter how hard they try to occlude, see how it's occluded in the back? So these teeth are brought together, but some parafunctional habit has caused these teeth not to close, to come into that occlusal line. Here we have an example of over jet, and that is the horizontal difference between the labio incisal of the mandibular teeth and the lingual incisal of the maxillary incisors, okay? Now we have an underjet, so we're just gonna change those descriptions, right? We're gonna have the lingual incisal measured to the, of the mandibular tooth measured to the labio incisal of the maxillary tooth. So we're going to measure this distance here, and that is an under jet. And here's our normal uh, over bite, and we want that to be just a couple, you know, two to three uh, millile millimeters here, okay? So notice how the maxillary tooth is slightly labial or facial to the mandibular tooth, right? And you're going to just see that incisal third of the facial surface of the uh, mandibular tooth is covered. So, in this figure, uh, you can see overbite, uh, the anterior view. A is the normal overbite with the incisal edges of the maxillary teeth. They are within that incisal third of the facial surface of the mandibular teeth. Okay, so that incisal third. I'm looking for my pen here. Okay, so right here. This incisal third is covered, okay? Um, then in B, we're gonna see a moderate overbite. And the incisal edges of the maxillary teeth are now covering to the middle third of the facial surface of the mandibular teeth, okay? So now we're invading this middle third of the mandibular teeth. 
and C, we're going to see a severe overbite. And the incisal edges of the maxillary teeth are now invading that third, that one third of the cervical portion of the mandibular anterior teeth. So when the incisal edges of the mandibular teeth are in contact with the maxillary lingual gingival tissue, the overbite is considered very severe. Okay, so if the incisal edge of these mandibular teeth are going up into the palate, the hard palate, then it's considered a severe uh, overbite. So overjet is how far uh, vertically they're going, okay? It's that, uh, excuse me, horizontally they're moving, okay? So you're going to be looking at it this way. But then with the, with the, uh, overbite, we're looking at the lateral, you know, how far laterally are they covering? Okay, and here you can see the normal occlusion and the classifications of malocclusion. You do need to know both the uh, canine relationship and the molar relationship. It used to be on the boards they only wanted to know the molar relationship, but about two or three years ago, they started introducing uh, the description of the canine relationship also. So you do need to be aware of what is happening with each of these. And what I want you to see <clears throat> is that they are always talking about the mandibular tooth. So we're gonna say in class two, the molar relationship, the buccal groove of the mandibular first permanent molar is distal to the mesial buccal cusp of the maxillary first permanent molar by at least a width of a premolar. And we always talk about that width of a premolar. So you're always going to say where the permanent uh, where the buccal groove of the mandibular is in relationship to the mesial buccal cusp tip of the maxillary tooth. So we always start by the description of the groove, the buccal groove of the mandibular first molar. Okay? And then the canine, you're going to find the cusp tip of the mandibular canine, where is it in relationship to the premolar and canine of the maxillary teeth? Okay. Now, do know that class two has two divisions, and division uh, one, the mandible is retruded and all the maxillary incisors are protruded, okay? So they are protruded, coming out this way. And then in class two, we're looking at a retrusion of the maxillary incisors, okay? So, and that can really change the patient's profile, right? And then our class three relationship, we're looking at the mandibular buccal groove is now going to be uh, mesial, okay? This groove is now mesial to the maxillary mesial buccal cusp tip of the first molar. And again, it needs to be a premolar's width. To determine the classification of occlusion, um, it, 
you want to know that it's based on the principles of uh, Dr. Edward H. Engel, and he presented this in the early 1900s. He defined normal as occlusion as the normal relationship of the inclusion inclined planes of the teeth when the jaws are closed. Okay, so you'll always be taking this relationship with the patient biting together. And he started this off by having only measuring the first permanent molars, okay? So although the authorities have since agreed that the maxillary first permanent molars do not occupy a fixed position in the dental arch, Engel's classification serves to provide an acceptable basis for classification. A more comprehensive assessment of malocclusion is made by the orthodontist who studies the relationship of the positions of teeth in the jaw, the facial profile, and the skull. So how are they all coming together? Uh, three general classifications of malocclusion are described in the following uh, sections. And these classes are designated by Roman numerals. So when you are writing your angles classification in the chart, you're going to be using Roman numerals. You will not be using one, two, or three. Uh, our, what do we call ours? The, I guess I'm just going to say English. I don't think that's correct. I can't think of uh, what it is we use, but you're going to be using Roman numerals, okay? Now, because the mandible is the movable portion and the maxilla is static, it is staying, it's stationary, the classes are described, uh, the relation, the classes describe the relationship of the mandible to that of the maxilla. For example, in disocclusion, class two, the mandible is distal whereas the mesial occlusion, class three, the mandible is gonna be mesial to the maxilla, okay? Now normal um, ideal occlusion, you should have a mesognathic facial profile. The molar relationship is gonna be where the mesial buccal cusp of the maxillary first permanent molar occludes with the buccal groove of the mandibular first permanent molar. In our canine relationship, the maxillary permanent canine occludes with the distal half of the mandibular canine and the mesial half of the mandibular first premolar. So they're kind of switching it around from what I said earlier um, and what the book often will state. Usually the book will state the mandibular uh, first, but you know it's good to have it uh, a vision, I guess, of both. Now, malocclusion, class one or neutral occlusion, the profile is gonna be the same as our normal occlusion. The molar relationship is going to be the same and the uh, canine relationship is going to be the same as normal occlusion. However, you may have some malpositioned teeth or a group of teeth. Okay, so rarely will you ever see that normal occlusion where everything is exactly where it needs to be. Because often people will have just a little bit of anterior crowding or maybe a slight uh, edge to edge or end to end somewhere. Um, so crowded maxillary or mandibular teeth, we could have an anterior or posterior crossbite, anything like that. But the molar relationship is the same, the canine relationship is the same, and the facial profile is still going to be that mesognathic profile. Class two or distal occlusion, the mandibular teeth uh, are positioned posterior to, the nor to their normal position, which is going to give you what kind of profile? Think of that mandible moving posterior. It's moving 
retro, it's going backwards, right? So you're going to get a retrognathic profile. The molar relationship, that buccal groove of the mandibular first permanent molar is distal to the mesial buccal cusp of the maxillary first permanent molar by at least the width of a premolar. When the distance is less than the width of a premolar, the relationship is classified as a class one with a tendency towards class two. So what do the canines look like? The distal surface of the mandibular canine is distal to the mesial surface of the maxillary canine by at least the width of a premolar. Again, when the distance isn't quite a premolar, you're going to go with the class one with a tendency towards two. Then we have class two division one, and that's where the mandible is retruded and all the maxillary incisors are protruded. The general types of conditions that frequently occur with class two division one malocclusion would be a really deep overbite, an excessive overjet, or abnormal lip muscle function. Okay, so short uh, mandible or uh, short upper lip. Now we have class two, division two, and that, again, our molar relationship doesn't change. The thing that's changing is that the uh, maxillary incisors one or more maxillary incisors are now going to be retruded. They're going to kind of tip in. Uh, general types of conditions that occur with this uh, malocclusion would be maxillary lateral incisor protrusion. Uh, so if your maxillary laterals are protruding and then the maxillary centrals are going to retrude. Uh, crowded maxillary anterior teeth or a deep overbite. So you can have uh, subdivisions where one side is a class one and one side is a class two. So you do need to check both the, the uh, right and the left sides. All right, let's move to our class three or our uh, mesio occlusion. Okay, class two was distal occlusion because the mandible was moving distally. Now we have mesial occlusion. It's moving forward. So you're going to get that profile, that prognathic profile, all right, where that, mandible, that mandible is really prominent. Think of the Jay Leno type occlusion or facial profile. Now, what do you expect the buccal groove of the mandibular first permanent molar to do? It's going to be mesial to that mesial buccal cusp tip of the maxillary first molar. And again, we want to measure that to be about a premolar's width. When it's not a premolar's width, we're going to again say a tendency towards class three. The canine relationship is going to be where the distal surface of the mandibular canine is mesial to the mesial surface of the maxillary canine, again, by at least a premolar's width. So types of conditions that occur with uh, class three malocclusion, a true class three uh, maxillary incisors are going to be lingual to the mandibular incisors. So that's going to create an anterior crossbite. Maxillary and mandibular incisors can also be found edge to edge in this occlusion. And then the mandibular incisors that are super crowded but not lingual 
to the maxillary incisors. So what has happened there is the jaws protruded, but the maxillary teeth are still going to be facial to those mandibular teeth, but those mandibular teeth are going to be super crowded, which is going to make it really difficult to clean. Again, the determination of classifications um, is based on Edward H. Engel and was presented in the 1900s, and we pretty much already went over all of this. Um, know that the what the normal ideal occlusion is. Uh, the normal ideal facial profile is going to be mesognathic. Molar relationship is going to be the mesial buccal cusp of the maxillary. First permanent molar is going to go right into that buccal groove of the mandibular first permanent molar. And then normal occlusion, the canine relationship, is going to be where the maxillary permanent canine is going to kind of rest in that distal half of the mandibular canine and the mesial half of the mandibular first premolar. So it's just going to kind of rest right in there. And we've already Sorry, that kind of cut off. We've already talked about the three classifications, but we're gonna go over it again here. Um, class one, we're gonna have neutral occlusion. Our pro facial profile is gonna be that mesognathic. Our molar relationship is gonna be fine, but what differentiates the class one from the uh, normal occlusion is that you're going to have some malpositioning of individual teeth or groups of teeth. In class two, we're going to see the mandibular molar, we're going to have distal occlusion, right? So the mandibular uh, first permanent molar is going to be distal to the mesial buccal cusp of the maxillary first permanent molar. All right, so the jaw has moved backwards. The mandibular jaw has moved backwards. So we're going to get that retrognathic facial profile. And then our uh, canine relationship, excuse me, <clears throat> is going to be where the mandibular canine is going to be more distal to the mesial surface of the maxillary canine. And remember, we're always looking at that premolar width. If it's not, then you just say it's a tendency towards a class two, but they're still falling under that class one occlusion. Class two division one is going to be the molar relationship and the canine relationship are going to be the same, but the maxillary incisors are going to be protruded. All right, and this frequently occurs um, with a deep overbite, an excessive overjet, abnormal muscle function, and short a short mandible or a short upper lip. Class two is going to be where one or more of those maxillary incisors are going to be retruded. And um, so this frequently occurs if, our, if the maxillary lateral incisors protrude a little bit, and then they cause those central incisors to retrude. They've kind of switched places there. Uh, this also happens with maxillary crowding of anterior teeth and deep overbite. So, and know that, that there can be subdivisions. One side might be a class one, one side might be a class two, okay? There can also be, um, you know, divisions. You can still have subdivisions with that also on one side or the other. All right. Um, me, the mesial occlusion, this is where our mandible is moving mesially. So you're going to get that protruded facial profile. The buccal groove of the mandibular first permanent molar is going to be mesial 
to the mesobuccal cusp of the maxillary first permanent molar. Again, it needs to be that premolar width. And then with the canine relationship, you're going to see the distal surface of the mandibular canine is going to be mesial to the mesial surface of the maxillary canine. General types of conditions that frequently occur in class 2 malocclusion in a true or class 3 malocclusion. In a true class 3, you're going to have an anterior crossbite. The maxillary anterior teeth are going to be lingual to the mandibular anterior teeth. But you can also get it to where get the class 3 um, malocclusion. Sometimes the anterior teeth are just going to be edge to edge. They're going to be sitting right on top of each other. And then sometimes the mandibular teeth can be lingual to the uh, maxillary teeth but for that to happen, they're going to be super crowded, okay? And that crowding, of course, is going to lead to difficulty cleaning those teeth. All right, so uh, occlusion of primary teeth, the normal ID, ideal occlusion, the primary canine relationship is going to be the same as the permanent dentition with the primate space. So you want to have those spaces in there to allow for permanent uh, teeth to erupt. Uh, the mandibular, you're going to look uh, between the mandibular canine and the first molar as seen on the next slide. And the maxillary is going to be between the maxillary lateral incisor and canine without primate space. So you're going to have closed arches. Our second primary relationship, molar relationship is going to be the mesial buccal cusp of the maxillary second primary molar. And if you remember from anatomy, the, man, the, the molars, the second molars of primary teeth often resemble that of the first permanent molars. So that makes sense that we would now look at the occlusion of the second primary molar with the buccal groove of the mandibular second primary molar um, is going to be lined up with the uh, mesial buccal cusp of the maxillary second primary molar. Okay, and then everything kind of stays the same there and how they move around. Um, let's see here, the terminal plane, uh, I guess we don't need to get too far into that, but the morphologic variation of molar size, the maxillary and mandibular primary molars have approximately the same mesiodistal width as the uh, premolars that will be coming in, okay? The terminal plane, the distal surface of the maxillary and mandibular uh, primary molars are on the same vertical plane. The effects of occlusion of the first uh, permanent molars, uh, the terminal step, you want to know that the first permanent molar erupts directly into the proper occlusion. The terminal plane, the first permanent molar erupts uh, end to end. So really don't, don't worry so much about that. Uh, just look for those molar relationships with the second primary molars. Uh, malocclusion of primary teeth is same as the permanent dentition. Now primate space, remember a diastema or gap in the teeth uh, row, okay, occasionally observed in the human primary dentition. So just know that, that those primate spaces are just going to allow space for permanent molars.
And here are those primate spaces. The maxillary primate space accommodates for the mandibular uh, canines and the mandibular primate space accommodates the maxillary space for the maxillary canines when the teeth are in occlusion. And here's the eruption patterns of the first permanent molars. Uh, the distal surface of the mandibular second primary molar is mesial to the distal surface of the maxillary primary molar. Uh, the terminal plane, you're going to see that the distal surface of the mandibular and the maxillary second primary molars. Okay, I think I was uh, cut off in the recording on the previous slide. And so I just want to uh, briefly discuss the terminal plane, and that's the distal surfaces of the mandibular and maxillary second primary molars. And they are on the same vertical plane as the permanent molars as they erupt in the end-to-end -end occlusion. <clears throat> okay, so we've been talking about uh, the static occlusion, which is, you know, just what is their bite? When they bite together, what's the molar relationships, okay? Now we need to start looking at the functional occlusion. And functional, think of how are you functioning throughout the day? So this consists of chewing and swallowing and any of the other normal activity that's associated with the uh, performance pressures or forces created by the muscles of mastication and then they're transmitted to the teeth after contact and then it goes to the periodontia. So we really need to know about these uh, forces because we're going to be dealing a lot with the periodontium, right? So these forces are now going to guide the teeth um, into eruption <clears throat> And the forces are necessary to provide function uh, stimulation for the preservation of health of the attachment apparatus, right? Because if they're hitting it too high, if one spot's too high, it's going to cause all sorts of problems, all right? So we're really going to look at the periodontal ligament and the cementum and alveolar bone uh, when we're talking about uh, parafunctional habits and um, issues here. All right, so there are <clears throat> a couple types of occlusal contacts. Functional contacts are the normal contacts that are made between the maxillary teeth and the mandibular teeth during chewing and swallowing. Each contact is momentary, so the total contact time throughout the day is limited to really just a few minutes. Our parafunctional contacts are those made outside of the normal range of function. They may result from biting habits or neuroses. These are potentially injurious to the periodontal supporting structures, but that can only happen in the presence of dental biofilm and inflammatory factors. So although they're hitting it high, it shouldn't cause a problem unless we have uh, that biofilm and the inflammatory factors present. Uh, these can also create wear facets and attrition on teeth. They can be divided into the following. Uh, into the following. So we have tooth-to-tooth <clears throat> -to -tooth contact, which is bruxism, clenching, tapping, and then tooth-to-hard object contact, such as nail biting, and occupational use of things such as tacks or pins, or the use of uh, smoking equipment such as a pipe stem or hard cigarette holder. And then we have tooth to oral tissue contacts such as lips and cheek biting. Those are all parafunctional contacts, okay? Those are outside of our normal chewing and swallowing contacts. Uh, <clears throat> primary contacts, we're looking at uh, proximal contacts that serve to stabilize the position of teeth and the dental arches and to provide food impaction between the teeth. 
attrition or wear of these teeth occur at the proximal contacts. Proximal meaning our mesial and distal contacts. Drifting is when the proximal contact is lost and teeth can then drift into the space created by the unreplaced missing tooth or teeth. There is a natural uh, tendency to drift mesially. They call it the mesial drift or the mesial migration of teeth towards the midline. <clears throat> In the absence of disease, the surrounding periodontal tissues adapt to the repositioned teeth. A pathological migration, this is when there's destruction of the supporting structures of the tooth, and this results uh, is a result of periodontal infection. And with a force to move the tooth is weakened by disease and bone loss, migration of the tooth can then result. So it's moving because of the destruction of the bone and the supporting structures of the tooth. <clears throat> this migration occurs when disease is present. In contrast to drifting is the migration of with a healthy periodontia, okay? So we have drifting, which is can happen no matter what, okay? It's just because a tooth has been lost. But even in health, it's going to drift a little bit. But with infection present and periodontal disease uh, present, then we have pathological migration. All right, periodontal injury caused by repeated occlusal forces that exceed the physiologic limits of tissue tolerance is called trauma from occlusion. And we had this in our um, Kahoot the other day, right? <clears throat> so trauma from occlusion. Other names uh, could be called periodontal traumatism, occlusal tra traumatism, or periodontal trauma. But uh, for the sake of being consistent with the book, we are going to call it trauma from occlusion. And it's pretty easy, right? Okay. Types of trauma from occlusion. Uh, we have primary trauma from occlusion, and that results with excessive occlusal force when it's exerted on a tooth with normal bony support. Okay. So an example would be the effects of a new restoration placed on a tooth in the line of occlusion, okay? Secondary trauma from occlusion occurs when excessive occlusal force is exerted on a tooth with bone loss and inadequate alveolar bone support, okay? The ability of the tooth to withstand occlusal forces is impaired. A tooth has lost the support of the surrounding bone. <clears throat> uh, even the pressures of what are usually considered within normal occlusal forces may create lesions of trauma from the occlusion. Okay, so primary think, you know, everything else is good, but there's just a little bit of uh, occlusal force from that new filling. Okay, maybe it's a little bit high. But then secondary is going to be due to the bone loss and that maybe that tooth is a little bit mobile and then those occlusal forces are causing trauma to it, which then can result in uh, a lesion. Okay. <clears throat> Effects of trauma from occlusion. Um, we have the attachment apparatus, which is what is part of our attachment apparatus. There are three things. Think of those quick. That's right. It's the periodontal ligament, cementum, and alveolar bone. Again, the attachment apparatus is the periodontal ligament, cementum, and alveolar bone. And it ha uh, has, okay, so let me start that over. The attachment apparatus has uh, as its main purpose the maintenance of tooth 
in the socket in a functional state. Okay? In a healthy situation, occlusal pressures and forces during chewing and swallowing are readily dispersed and absorbed and no unusual effects are produced. Okay? So when, if you guys all just want to kind of tap your teeth together, you can probably hear me doing mine. Is there anywhere where it's hitting harder, so then do it slowly? Are you coming, is everything coming together in one swoop? And what that does is you have incredible biting force. And if everything is coming together at the same time, if everything's in equilibrium, all that pressure is going to be dispersed amongst all of the teeth. If it's not, if it's only going on to one tooth, then we're in trouble city. Okay? So, <clears throat> excessive forces is when the forces of occlusion are greater than can be taken care of by the attachment apparatus and damage can result. Circulatory disturbances, uh, tissue destruction, from the crushing under pressure, bone resorption, and other pathologic processes are all initiated. The relation to inflammatory factors, trauma from occlusion does not cause gingivitis, periodontitis, or pocket formation. In the presence of inflammatory disease, the existing periodontal destruction may be aggravated or promoted by the trauma from occlusion. So if we already have a pathology there, if we are already dealing with periodontal disease or gingivitis, and then you add this secondary factor where these forces are so great on one or two teeth, it's going to cause a, a, a speed up in the, an accelerated process of bone destruction and attachment destruction, okay? So know that the normal occlusal forces um, are not gonna cause gingivitis or cause periodontal disease. It can cause other things, but it's not gonna cause our gingivitis and our periodontal disease. But if those are already present, it's just gonna make it worse, okay? <clears throat> All right, so to understand the nature of the occlusal forces that can cause periodontal trauma from occlusion, it's helpful to recognize the types of tooth contacts that can overburden a tooth or a group of teeth. So we have individual teeth that touch uh, before full closure. All right, this contact is premature and can put excessive forces on an individual tooth. So again, tap your teeth together. Are you hitting harder in one spot or prematurely in one spot than in others? Two or only a few teeth in contact during movement of the jaw, the teeth involved receive a disproportionate amount of force. <clears throat> Initial contact on inclined planes of, of cusp uh, following initial contact, when these teeth are brought together in a closed position, they may be ex there may be excessive pressure on the teeth where the initial contact was made. Okay, so although you, it's uh, early contact, it might your teeth still might be able to come together eventually but you're gonna just end up putting more force on those few teeth that initially contacted. Then we have heavy forces, not in a vertical or axial direction. So normal occlusion relationship implies a direct cusp to fossa position during closure, right? So the cusp of the um, mandibular molars is gonna go in the fossa or the occlusal surface of the uh, maxillary teeth, right? 
So with this force of occlusion in a vertical direction towards the tooth apex and parallel with the long axis, when pressures are exerted laterally or horizontally, excessive force is placed on the periodontal attachment apparatus. <clears throat> so bite together and I'll slide your teeth from one side to the other, okay? Slowly doing that, keeping your cusp in relationship with the tooth. There should be, uh, as you slide across, it should you should ride up on your cuspids, your canines, as you're going. If you aren't, then you have excessive lateral forces on those molars. So increased frequency, intensity, and duration in the presence of parafunctional habits, such as bruxing, clenching, tapping, biting objects, uh, many more than the usual number of tooth contacts are made each day, and the intensity and duration is then going to be altered. <clears throat> no one clinical or radiographic finding clearly defines the presence of trauma from occlusion. Diagnosis of the condition is complex. The possible observations uh, listed as follows are looked for specifically and recorded for evaluation and correlation with the patient's history and all other clinical determinations. So clinical findings that may occur in, occlusal, in trauma from occlusion would be tooth mobility, frematis, that's those vibrations when the teeth are occluded together, uh, sensitivity of teeth to pressure and or percussion, pathologic migrations, so look at the x-rays, what's happening there. You might see some wear facets or atypical incisal or occlusal wear. Open contacts related to food impaction, you know, is your patient all of a sudden reporting that, hey, I'm packing food up in that area. And then we have neuromuscular disturbances in the muscles of mastication. And in severe cases, muscle spasm can occur, and then our TMJ symptoms or TMD symptoms start to occur. Now, what are we going to see radiographically? Well, characteristics that may occur in trauma from occlusion include a widened PDL space, particularly angular thickening, so it's going to be kind of triangulation. This finding frequently occurs in conjunction with tooth mobility. So if you see a widened PDL, you're going to learn how to check mobility in the mouth. But what you do is you take two instruments, the ends of two instruments, and you just kind of tip the tooth back and forth. Because if you're using your fingers, it's going to be uh, the, the skin on your fingers is going to make it feel like it's mobile. So you use two solid instruments to check for mobility. <clears throat> Um, you could also find some root resorption. You might see some furcation involvement, especially if there was disease ahead of time, right? Uh, thickened lamina dura. Although related to occlusal forces, thickened lamina dura should not be considered a determined, uh, detrimental or destructive effect of trauma from occlusion. So you may see it, but then we start looking for other signs also to confirm it. It may be a dense reaction to the strength of tooth support against occlusal forces. Thickened lamina dura is frequently associated with teeth that have undergone orthodontic treatment. So when we start taking x-rays on each other, you know, and you know that they've had orthodontics, check that lamina dura. See if you can tell if they've had ortho or not. The American <clears throat> Association of Orthodontics recommends all children see an orthodontist by age seven for early identification problems. Uh, the observation, or they, they're gonna observe the facial profile as the patient enters and is seated in the dental chair. Um, you wanna check the closing of their 
their centric relation, right? So you're going to check the profile, then you're going to start taking a look at those first molars and those canines. Well, they won't have them at age seven yet. <clears throat> then you're going to look for circulatory disturbances, uh, tissue destruction from those crushing uh, pressure of, of biting. You're going to look for bone resorption and any other pathologic processes that may be initiated. Uh, relation to inflammatory factors, trauma from occlusion does not cause gingivitis, periodontitis, or pocket formation. The steps in the development of inflammatory disease in pockets are outlined in Chapter 19. Uh, in the presence of inflammatory disease, the existing periodontal destruction may be aggravated or promoted by trauma from occlusion. Okay, now methods of application of excess pressure. <clears throat> Sorry, got a little bit of a cold here. Uh, to understand the nature of the occlusal forces that can cause periodontal trauma from occlusion, it is helpful to recognize the types of tooth contacts that can overburden a tooth or a group of teeth. Okay, so is a filling too high? Um, you know, did one side erupt more than another? Okay, initial contacts on the inclined planes of cusp, uh, following the initial contact, when the teeth are brought together in a closed position, there may be excess pressure on the teeth where initial contact was made, okay? So please always, especially um, when you're doing sealants, you want to make sure that when they come together, when you know you say tap, 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 and they bite down, you know you want to ask them how it feels to them because people can pick up just the smallest differences in a mouth, and you want to make sure that nothing is hanging them up that could potentially lead to problems. Okay, um, so increase, increased frequency, intensity, and duration of contacts in the presence of parafunctional habits, such as bruxism, clenching, tapping, or biting objects, uh, many more than the usual number of tooth contacts are made each day, and the intensity and duration are altered. So we're overusing them, okay? All right, so interpretation of the general purpose of orthodontic care to patients uh, referred by the dentist to an orthodontist, a dependence of masticatory efficacy or efficiency, sorry, on the occlusion of the teeth. You want to evaluate the influence of um, mastic masticatory efficiency and diet on the nutritional status of the body and oral health. Interpretation of the dentist's suggestions for the correction of oral habits, such as thumb sucking, clenching, grinding, uh, anything like that. Uh, space maintaining. Do the primary teeth have enough space for those permanent teeth? The role of malocclusion as a predisposing factor for biofilm retention. So, you know, think of the lower anterior crowding. You have all that that bacteria sitting there and it's so hard to get because that space is thinner than your toothbrush than the width of your toothbrush so how are you going to clean that okay um, the relationship of the occlusion and position of the teeth to the patient's personal oral care procedures selection of appropriate types of toothbrushes and any um, adjuncts that you may want to give them how are they going to get that clean right um, you want to teach them how to use dental floss and use it properly, which we're going to talk about later on. And then use, uh, and then specific reasons for frequency of maintenance exams, one related to malocclusion, and while in the process of having orthodontic therapy. <clears throat> 
All right, so I think that wraps it all up. I think so. I think I have a duplicate slide here. Um, oh, no, selection for the proper toothbrush, application of thorough toothbrushing methods, uh, use of dental floss, and the need for continuing care appointments related to malocclusion. I know when I had, um, when I was working in perio, I had a patient who had braces on and she would come in every two to three months. She would have them take the wire out. She would come in, have her teeth cleaned and then go back and have the um, wires put back on and everything redone. So you think about the benefit of her doing that when we are talking about those tough occlusal forces and the effects of having bacteria in that area while it's out of occlusion and how you can get that bone loss. It's really scary to think about what's happening in these people's mouths as we're moving their teeth, right? So we just need to really emphasize good oral hygiene amongst these patients. All right. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.